Dear friends, welcome to the panel discussion on Multivalent Societies, Mirror South Asian Literature on Day 3 of Asian Literary Societies, Nagar 2021. As you know, the Asian Literary Societies Annual Nagar 2021 Festival okay. is a nine days online festival of art, culture, and literature. Like last year, this year again, we are here with one more panel discussion with three eminent literary illuminatives. We are truly grateful to these eminent participants for accepting our request to grace the Navraj 2021 with their August presence. Now, I'll quickly introduce our moderator of today's session, Vishakha Sharma. Dr. Vishakha Sharma is a linguist who specializes in the documentation of endangered and lesser known languages. She is a passionate writer, her writings both in prose and poetry have been published in journals and anthologies. She is an administrator of the Asian Literary Society. She has learned Indian classical music instrumental Mohan Veena from Ravi Shankar Institute of Music and Performing Arts New Delhi. Welcome, Vishakha Ji, and now over to you. Thank you. Please welcome the panelists. Yes, Vishakha Ji, please. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, viewers. Good evening. Yes, please. Yeah. Please continue. Good evening, viewers. Should I start, Mr. Manoj? Yes, yeah, sure. A warm welcome to this wonderful panel discussion on a much sensational theme, multivalent societies mirror South Asian literature. Before we start the discussion, friends, I will introduce you all to our esteemed panelists. Mr. Balmiki Prasad Singh, welcome, sir. Mr. Singh is a distinguished scholar, thinker, and a retired IS officer. Mr. Singh has held important positions within the state of Assam, as well as in the government of India and also an international organization. At the center, he was additional secretary, ministry of environment and forest, culture secretary, and home secretary in government of India. He was executive director and ambassador at the World Bank at Washington, this year later, governor of the king. As an international civil servant, Mr. Singh served as executive director and ambassador at the World Bank representing India, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, and was one of the founder members of the Development Gateway Foundation and member Global Environment Facility, Washington, DC. His role was formally hailed as an ambassador extraordinaire of the world's poor. As an intellectual with avid interest in academics, Mr. Singh held a variety of honorary academic and governmental assignments, including Chancellor of the Central University of Tibetan Studies, Sarnath, for seven years, and President Namgyal Institute of Tibetology for five years, etc. As Cultural Secretary, <coughs> Government of India, Mr. Singh organized the Golden Jubilee celebrations of India's independence at the global level and he had set up national culture fund to promote public private partnership in conservation of national heritage sites and monuments which was operational in india and has been mutatis mutandis adopted by bhutan and mexico <coughs> but some of the countries have incorporated some of its features in their schemes mr singh also devised government scheme to support through endowments and staff entitlements, Guru Shishya Parampara schools and Buddhist and Gandhian organizations in the country. Mr. Singh is well known as author of the Bahuda approach, which outlines the path towards a harmonious world as against the clash of civilizations. Mr. Singh is an eminent public speaker in English and Hindi and has delivered memorial lectures and speeches at national and global levels. Mr. Singh presided over the four-day global Buddhist congregation in November 2011 in New Delhi, attended by around 1,000 Buddhist scholars, 
thinkers and followers from over 30 countries to mark the 2600th year of Buddha enlightenment. Mr. Singh is currently working on promotion of peace, science, culture, and democracy through his association with several organizations and by writing and speeches. His major books are The Problem of Change, A Study of Northeast India, India India's Culture, The State, The Arts, and Beyond, Bahuda and the Post, 9 by 11 World, The 21st Century, Geopolitics, Democracy, and Peace. He has also written books for students. Our India, NCERT 2011, and Hamara Bharat Varsha. He has an editorial book, The Millennium Book on New Delhi. A hearty welcome to Mr. Balmiki Prasad Singh on the Forum of Asian Literary Society. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Our next panelist, Mr. Amit Das Gupta, served the Indian Foreign Service for 34 years. He has a BCom degree from St. Javier's College, Kolkata, an MA and an MPhil in sociology from the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and a two-year attachment with the Department of Sociology at the University of McGill in Canada. He was the recipient of the National Merit Scholarship and the Commonwealth Fellowship and has attended an EDP at the Indian School of Business in Hyderabad. During his diplomatic career, Mr. Rafa served inter alia as Director of Finance, Deputy Director General Indian Council for Cultural Relations and Joint Secretary Public Diplomacy at the Ministry of <coughs> External Affairs. He was first Secretary Political at the Embassy in Brussels, Director Economic and Head of the Office of the SARC Secretary General in Kathmandu, <coughs> Deputy Ambassador in Berlin, Consul General in uh, Sydney, and Ambassador in the Philippines with concurrent accreditation to the Republics of Palau, the Marshall Islands, and Micronesia. After being superannuated from the Philippines, in October 2013, as ambassador, Mr. Das Gupta took to full-time writing while living in Vishakhapatnam, which resulted in the Harper Collins <laughs> publication of the book, Lessons from Ruslana. Soon, he was inaugural head of Mumbai campus of the internationally ranked S.P. Jain School of Global Management for 14 months. He joined as the inaugural head inaugural India country director of the internationally ranked University of New South Wales, Sydney. He was an appointed distinguished fellow of the Australia India Institute and is also fellow of the Society of Policy Studies, India. Mr. Das Gupta is an eminent writer of both fiction and non-fiction. Some of, his, some of his fiction books are The House and Other Stories, Telling Tales, Children's Literature in India, The Lost Fragrance, In the Land of the Blue Jasmine, The Phoenix Rises, Lockdown Memoirs, A Quiet Noise is going to be published, Indian by Choice. Nonfiction books are Wisdom Tree, India for a Billion Reasons. A creative nonfiction book is Lessons from Ruslana, in search of transformative thinking. Another book is Why We Fail, which is going to be published soon. Mr. Das Gupta also published extensively on foreign and security policy and on development and management related themes and over the past few years on India's higher education challenges. A hearty welcome to Mr. Amit Das Gupta on the Forum of Asian Literary Society. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Our next panelist, Dr. Kuladhar Saikya. Dr. Kuladhar Saikya is a Fulbright scholar and winner of several literary awards, who is an alumnus from Delhi School of Economics, Pennsylvania State University, and a doctorate from Indian Institute of Technology. Dr. Saikya had won the Science Academy Award in 2015 
for his book akathor sobi aru onnyanno golpo that is picture of the sky and other tales he also won the katha award for creative fiction he has written 21 short stories poems critical essays and plays by profession dr saitya is an ex officer of indian police service who had retired in 2019 as director general of police at guwahati assam he ha he has been involved in issues relating to community development and community policing he was a recipient of president police medals twice for his outstanding contribution to policing he was the initiator and nodal officer of assam police community empowerment initiative called project prahari to fight against social prejudices economic isolation and militancy in the remote tribal villages he was one of the founders of economic policy research group called assam prakalpo he is the president of assam sahitya sabha the oldest literary cultural organization of assam constituted for the development of assamese language literature and culture mr saikya contribution to growth and development of assamese literature is significant a hearty welcome to dr kulodhar saikya the forum of asian literary society welcome sir thank you welcome viewers once again to provide you all with the basic foundation of the discussion to put forth our discussion south asia <coughs> comprising of india pakistan bangladesh sri lanka afghanistan nepal bhutan and the maldives is the most linguistically diverse region with six major language families Indo-Aryan, Dravidian, Austroasiatic, Tibeto-Burman, Thai Kadai, and Great Andamanic. The South Asian civilization has its origin in the rich traditions and culture of varied communities who have settled in successive waves over centuries. There are efforts to represent not only the unified tradition of South Asia but also its rich tapestry. of regional languages local customs religious beliefs and practices dresses cuisines which has continued into the present in the past south asian literature was recognized as the classical literature in the vedas the puranas the epics of valmiki vyasa sanskrit text etc in the present time the ingenuous form of expression in south asian literature is english in order to meet the utility of the modern young readers from across south asia there are profuse translations of masterpieces from various languages into english south asian literature dwells on the experiences of migration poverty oppression and violence racism or marginalization gender biasness religious strife gendered ethnicized and nationalized identity indian labor diaspora etc the advent of salman rusty arundhati roy vikram seth chumpa lahiri etc made south asian literature find expression relatable to our present experiences the writers show a shift from the tradition of suffering self sacrificing women seeking for their identity to a rational minded confident being their exposure to progressive societies transform their perspectives of looking into things in various domains of societies in particular and life in general while the present generation finds more relevant with the progressive western societies they remain ignorant of the multivalent that lay deep in the history culture and people of south asia at the same time the people of the world at large need to know south asia in its true nature this is viable only through south asian literature so friends today we are discussing on the theme 
the multivalent societies mirror South Asian literature. My first question to Mr. Dal Gupta. Sir, how do the multivalent societies or multicultural pluralistic societies of India in particular and South Asia in general is represented in South Asian literature? Uh, thank you for the question, Taka, and it's um, it's a great honor to to be a panelist with such eminent participants like um, uh, the Honorable Deep Singh and um, uh, Kulo Saikia, and of course moderated by someone like me. being a little controversial, and say that. Um, 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 I find it very difficult to adjust to two words. One is I find Indian literature uh, as a term very difficult to understand in as much as I find South Asian literature as a term difficult to understand. I can understand literature from India or literature from South Asia. But when you say Indian literature or you say South Asian literature, you sort of assume that there is a sense of homogeneity uh, in, in what we are talking about. And I dare say, even if you take the case of India, uh, the writings that come out from uh, Bengal, which is from where I am, or Assam, are uh, where, where uh, my, my family came from, uh, my parents' side. Uh, are quite different from the literature uh, that comes out of Tamil Nadu and uh, or or Maharashtra or Karnataka or Kashmir uh, or or anywhere within India for that matter, which means that uh, to to club them all together under a blanket term like Indian literature could, to my mind, be a bit of a misnomer. The same problem we have when we talk about South Asian literature. And it's, it's like assuming that there is a common identity which binds us all. And I believe there isn't. I don't think there is a common identity that holds us all together. I believe each country, in as much as each state within India, has its own individual and very powerful identity. At the same time, when we talk about, let's say, Bangla literature, uh, we tend to feel that anything written in Bengali is Bangla literature, and anything lit written in Kannada is Carnatic literature, and those are the classifications we make. And uh, language is a very powerful indicator of identity. I think, therefore, that when we approach this subject, it would be useful for us to consider that the region, whether we're talking about India or we're talking about South Asia, and by the way, South Asia is not just how, let's say, SARC sees it. Um, I, I very much think that Myanmar is part of the South Asian uh, matrix. Afghanistan most certainly is. So when we talk about South Asia or India, I think the heterogeneity is important for us to recognize. It's important for us to also uh, uh, recognize and, and, and give credence and respect to the fact that there are identities, multiple identities that are reflected in writing. And uh, this, this, therefore, would be my initial and first response. And therefore, to try and see how we can mix and match and create a community, I don't think that works. I don't think it works. I think uh, literature from India does stand out. Uh, unfortunately, when we talk about the region that we call South Asia, because of India's size, because of um, India's population, etc., etc., <coughs> the dominant writing that is known within the region are by Indian authors. 
and whether they are from Assam or from Bengal or from, I mean, you mentioned Vikram Seth, uh, they don't live, I mean, he doesn't live here. Uh, you know, I mean, Sumpa Lahiri doesn't live here. Uh, and and, and there are, Amitabh Ghosh doesn't live here. Uh, so, you know, when we, but, but these are the dominant players that immediately come to mind. Um, and, 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 and I, I think there is an unfairness in all of this because the writings from places like Nepal, from Bangladesh, from from Bhutan, from Pakistan, uh, from the Maldives, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, Myanmar, there, there are no, no translations that are available. The opportunity for them to be read is not available. It's possibly denied to them if I use a strong word. And therefore, for us to really debate and discuss, uh, uh, is there a South Asian literature? To my mind, is a complex question. I'm happy to, to, to elaborate if you'd like me to. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> I go to uh, Mr. Singh. My next yes. question. Uh, so it is said that words and texts are so much of the world that it provides a vivid impression of the power, ownership, authority, marginalization, imposition of forces, etc. How far do you think the literature could do justice to present South Asia in its true spirit? Let me at the outset express my deep sense of happiness in joining this dialogue. It is very, very rare that uh, a dialogue consists of representatives of three of the most important services of India, IPS, IFS and IES. I also would like to compliment the organizers for choosing this title, Multivalent Society, and then saying literature is the mirror. It is almost like saying in a pandemic infected society that it is the X-ray of the nature of the problem that you have. In some sense it is true, but I also have the dilemma, which I told you when you told me about South Asian literature, that uh, when I was looking at something in Urissa, in connection with the lecture that I gave on the message of Kalinga, I found that uh, Uriya language of that time was not confined to Uriya, it had gone over to Bali. It travels. So it's very difficult to confine a language to a region when it has wider appeal. And in India, from ancient times, we have the tradition of oral language because there was no printing words. And this entire Surti and Smriti tradition is a kind of something which gives us that, yes, it mirrors, but it changes. You know, slokas of Rigveda also changed because there was a dialogue between the Guru and the Shifu. He has to remember. And in that dialogue, to make it intelligible, words changed. And I was really moved, if uh, you permit me, I will quote Tagore on this, because he put uh, something which is very, very important uh, that uh, should instill that pride in all of us. And I have put it in the children's book, uh, because uh, they should know that uh, how things changed. And things uh, changed uh, because of literature. And uh, he says, this is a small quotation, in, uh, he says, I love India. 
not because I cultivate the idolatry of geography and because I have had the chance to be born in her soil, but because she has she has saved through tumultuous ages the living words that have issued from the illuminated consciousness of her great sons. When you put literature at that level and something comes out from the illuminated consciousness of her sons and daughters, then that is the mirror. And then there is no boundary of South Asia, East Asia and things of that nature. And therefore, to presume that we have a South Asia literature, we have a literature. And, uh, and we have a literature from pre-digital era, pre-printing era, pre-pre. And this was what Tagore was referring to. And this is something which ordinary people have preserved. And ordinary people, when they preserve, they don't preserve many things. And that's why literature is the mirror. Literature is the external of what you have in the society as a living organism. The second thing which you asked, you know, everything is uh, not, uh, you know, when politics dominates you, when cultural events dominate you, they get mixed up sometimes. Educational systems get mixed up. But the real quest goes on. And the real quest is to build a homogeneous society, to build human character. So that, because Sri Aurobindo used to say, and he's right, when he says that, look, there is something beyond, that is the spiritual aspect of India. Indians have always failed. They are very interested in externalities, but they have always felt that there is something beyond, and that is a spirituality. So a literature keeps alive is a mirror also of a spiritual value, mundane as well as a spiritual value. So let us take it in that light. Yeah. South Asia, because we are living in India, so we feel this is South Asia. But there's something more, there's something external, and yeah. literature catches that. Thank you. So I thought I put it in that broad framework. I yeah, yeah. That. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Saikya, <clears throat> sir, while we take pride on the multivalence of South Asia, what are its strengths and weaknesses as mirrored in South Asian literature? Thank you, uh, everyone. In fact, the panelists have been known to me for quite long and wonderful opportunity to meet all of them and, of course, you and your organization. But uh, the issue raised by Mr. Basgupta was looking a little relevant. And Mr. B.P. Singh has said that even though, you know, the geographical concept may not come into literature, so I'll not go into that particular area. I'll, I'll uh, try to talk about the issue of multivalence as you raised in the question. Now, um, I think the common thread amongst these nationalities in the North, in the uh, Southeast Asia, are basically the, 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 the diverse culture, multiculturalism, as you say, then uh, you know the, the sort of inner and uh, you know underflowing current of you know um, sort of uh, similarities of cultural ethos and cultural uh, relations 
of different subgroups of communities in Northeast as well as that of Southeast Asia. Well, what I mean to say is a Northeasterner in India today would like to see in small groups of his own, then he might as well look into in a bigger domain, right? Then at the crossroads, he would again would like to say that, look, my if you look at my phenotypes, I might as well have the cultural uh, linkages with the uh, with some of the countries beyond the border. So what I mean to say is these type of diversities in all sorts of diversities, we recognize and respect the diverse elements in the culture and languages. See, we have in India uh, more than 200 languages, right? Apart from the different dialects, if you talk about the Northeast, you have so many languages, so many dialects, even the smaller yeah. communities. Now, the type of problems we have now is whether the languages, the smaller community languages will be, uh, there will be a language shift, say, from their own, uh, own dialect towards some rich language. Now, that is a sort of worry for the different communities here. That's really true because, uh, you know, in the world, a lot of languages have been uh, actually gone through the linguicide, you know, it's like homicide, you know, language is being eliminated because of the dominant language, the other dominant language. So this is one fear, and I think this is a very common trait, you know, uh, the people here in Northeast, even though we have multiple ethnic groups, cultural and linguistic uh, entities, but this is a similar, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's a common trade amongst us. So my point is, that is the fear, but what are the opportunities of these diverse diversities amongst us? One of the reasons that, you know, what the diverse elements in our culture, you know, the, the, my neighborhood may have little different cultures. I, uh, we have been living it all together in such a wonderful way because we are open and, uh, you know, the different communities are open to other cultures so that there is no cultural shock at all. And you'll be surprised that long back it was said by the president of Assam Sahitya Sabha in early days that, you know, uh, more than 50 percent words in SMEs do come from Boro and other tribal languages. That is the reason why SME has become almost a lingua franca in this area. So what I mean to say is that this diverse and this multivalence in our society in the Northeast have given sort of a value system which is very, very convenient for all the smaller communities to grow. In this context, you might as well refer to why, uh, you know, uh, why there are ethnic violence, why there are ethnic riots, Sometime, you know, those issues are there, but for centuries we have been living together, together and reaching each other. So I feel there is every possibility of uh, strength in these multivalent societies to learn and to grow together. It may not, uh, it may be a lonely, a non-linear type of uh, relationship, right? In a say like a like in chaos theory, right? It's not. Uh, it's very dynamic. Keeps on changing. Right, it may be as well seen and as complementarity that all different sets of small little cultures they are put together, they are learning each other from each, they are learning from each other, and they are interacting with each, each other and enriching themselves. So I feel this complementarity and the non-linearity have really made us proud of our diversity and multivalent society. All right. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, I would come to Mr. Das Gupta. So, as South Asian people, I believe we show empathy towards each other. The, the variance lies in the wealth we store in the myths and history, the rituals, the vibrant culture, natural diversity, ethnicity, linguistic identity, etc. 
how does South Asian literature provide a unified picture of South Asia? Uh, good question and a difficult one as, as uh, all your wonderful questions. Let me, let me, let me try and approach this um, uh, drawing on, on the remarks I started off with and what uh, the Honorable uh, Mr. B.P. Singh said and my friend Kulo Saikia. <clears throat> Let me start by saying that <clears throat> the question of identity has been uh, a matter of fascination uh, for centuries. And uh, it, it has been a quest that people have tried to understand essentially from the philosophical tradition and the question who am i but if you turn that question around a little bit if you if you were to tweak it um, as we as we like to say so instead of asking who am i if you make the question who are we then it becomes a sociological question because we talks about a community it's not just the individual but it's the it's the space that he occupies macro space uh, right now when we say south asia um, or if we say india it's also a macro space if we say um, Karnataka. it's very large it's not your immediate neighborhood uh, in terms of uh, where you live. So the question then of identity and the question then of, of identity synergizing in such a manner that uh, you are able to coexist, you're able to appreciate it, you're able to uh, uh, find that it, it actually is part and parcel of your own way of thinking. You know, the Germans call the Welten Schon. So it becomes part of your way of thinking. And <clears throat> it's not, it's not um, a contradiction and it's not alien. I believe that when we start talking about things like an Indian identity or a South Asian identity, there are some problems that arise. And the problems are to share with you that there is a tendency for a dominant identity to assert itself. And this assertion can very often subjugate other identities. Now, I don't think that such a situation leads to a harmonious relationship. I believe there is underlying tension there. You know, I mean, if, if, you, if you feel that identity one from one part of India can decide what is the identity of all Indians, uh, then I think we have a problem. And similarly, <clears throat> if we took the view that the South Asian identity would be determined by the dominant identity, which is the Indian identity, we again have a problem. Of course, there are similarities. You know, Bhutan is essentially a Buddhist country. But Bhutanese Buddhism is very different from Buddhism in Nepal or Buddhism in Sri Lanka. But it is the overall, uh, let's say, drawing power, the overall attraction, the overall magnet is still Buddhism. Uh, Nepal is a Hindu country. And, uh, we are a very large number of Hindus in India. The majority religion is Hinduism. But Hinduism as practiced in Nepal is quite different from the Hinduism as practiced in India. And uh, so if you, if you look at this in a broader manner, I would say that, let me give you a simile or a, or, or a metaphor. Let me give you a metaphor. If you take the word mosaic, for example, and you say India is a mosaic. In a mosaic, you have 
different, let's say, cultures in this case, all put side together and you get you get a conglomerate, right? But each piece doesn't actually interact with the other pieces. Yeah, they're separate and then they're put together. I don't think that's in there. But if we make that as the way of looking towards India, then I believe there's a problem. I believe India, uh, I believe South Asia needs to be seen more in the lines of a peacock's feather, where you have multiple colors. One color blends into the adjacent color. All the colors are distinct, yet you cannot separate the colors. Now, this to myself, to my mind, is essentially the kind of coexistence and the kind of collaborative coexistence that I believe unity in diversity is meant to represent. Unity in diversity is not the subjugation of diverse cultures by the dominant culture. And I think, uh, to a large extent, uh, you mentioned about areas like folk literature and folk traditions. Do these bring us closer together? I believe what's happening today in a rapidly changing world is that regions, not just South Asia, but across the globe, are being united by a very strange phenomenon called technology. It is technology which is becoming the dominant culture. And technology or respond to situations, to incidents, to people, to other people. And uh, uh, much of the, the, the religious uh, ideas are most certainly going to continue as part of our culture. But I think the unifying dominant uh, force that drives all of us is likely to be technology. It's not likely to be uh, anything else. Most certainly not religion. And uh, uh, I believe that literature then, therefore, will reflect how the author looks at his or her surroundings, given the, the kind of contemporary situation he or he is in. So that would be my, my response to your question. Wonderful, wonderful, sir. Uh, my, my next question goes to Mr. Singh. Sir, the quest for identity forms an elaborate space of South Asian literature. In diasporic literature, many writers are known to produce magnificent texts <clears throat> regarding identity consciousness. Now, how is identity understood from the perspective of South Asian literature? I must tell you that uh, identity consciousness <clears throat> and identity crisis both have to be appreciated in the context of various aspects. I was looking at, uh, say, the Ramayana and Mahabharata, Christianity and Islam coming to North Eastern. And I found that I had difficulty in locating either the Ramcharitra Manas of Tulsi Dance or Ramayana of Balmiki. But Mahabharata was there. Well, I am telling you that the tradition goes, even if the text does not go. So in the whole of the region, it is, I called it in my book, like the Ramayana Mahabharata tradition. And then you find associated expressions are there of the Ramayana in the different parts of Assam, of uh, Mahabharata in uh, Manipur. And, and then simultaneously, we have this Bhakti movement. A bhakti movement was there against social kind of uh, discrimination. And that movement, which is started from the south, 
with water from Allahabad and Varanasi. And then it, leaders were initially from Tamil Nadu and, and uh, Kerala. And then it uh, comes down to different parts of India. And the tallest expression of that we find it in the northeast is of Sriman Mahapuru Shankar Dev and how he saved that community. Then Mahabharata had all its own. Then in other parts of India also. So Shankar Dev in the 15th century, Guru Nanak and Kavi. But there was another movement that was the Christianity, which brought in language, which brought in new literature, and that was also accepted by the movement. Then there was a third that was of Islam. So when we think of crisis, we must also think of, you know, harmony. And harmonious situation has to so well. And this is best illustrated. This is not my story, but I heard it from a nomadic literature some time back. And I have heard this story orally also given in seminars. And this was of the pigeons. There was a temple and some festival was coming, so they decided to paint the whole temple. Now pigeons had to be removed. They sensed that now where we will go. So they flew to the neighboring mosque. And the pigeons of the mosque said, come, we have enough escape. Now there was no problem. Then the church had to be removed. Uh, December had. So then the word will go, then they both flew to church. And there was no problem. But one day they find, while they were in the church, that these three are fighting. People are fighting Hindus, Muslims, Christians. Violent. So the people said, What is wrong? So that also happens. The harmony also happens. Ethnic disharmony, cultural disharmony, you know, religious disharmony. And that solution, pigeons had no problem. Gandhi had this problem. That how do you solve this problem? And he took again the course to his Narsim Mehta, Vaisnav Jante Tine Kahiyo Jo Peer Parai, Allah Ishwar Tere. And he said, empathy. So if literature gives you empathy, respect for others calling to you, which I call Bahuda, yeah. then you have no problem. It can be solved. And I must tell you, I am an optimist. I must tell you, North East India, minus a few things, they have been doing a good job. The problems will remain. And literature must provide that role of empathy, yeah. of sending Thank you, others. Sir. So long a literature gets, it serves its purpose. Thank you. Wonderful. Dr. Saikya, sir, issues of home and nation are key concepts, both thematically and rhetorically in South Asian literature, resulting into several essays and provocative prose affirming ethnic identity as South Asian. So how do a South Asian writer illustrate the concept of identity from the perspective of belongingness. 
Good. In fact, uh, the, uh, the question of identity is then question of belongingness. All these are so much important. It's good that you have put these you know, two issues together in the uh, you know question itself. Now the point is identity is basically shaped by the culture. What is culture and identity? Culture and identity basically you know the shared uh, beliefs, shared language, shared uh, our behavior and all other things which has been shared from generation to generation. Now the question of identity, though we say it's, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, very often it, we talk about our identities and ethnicity and things like that. But the word ethnic or ethnicity itself is a very debatable word. It doesn't define very precisely what is ethnicity or ethnic, right? But broadly, what I feel is the question, the issues involved in identity and uh, ethnicity in case of Northeast and in other places as well, cannot be seen in terms of binary form, right? That a lot of times we try to brand it in binary form, like it's locals versus outsiders. This is uh, hills versus plains, tribals versus non-tribals, right? Such type of binary, decisions or binary way of looking at the problem or issues are is not very correct in fact what i feel is the whole issue of identity when it starts in your uh, see identity where, where when it develops you know uh, how you look at the identity the, the whole procedure you know the whole process of identification see within your own small group you start demanding your own rights Right. After that, you start uh, in a broader perspective. You start competing with some other groups, <clears throat> other entities. So this is one issue. Third issue is not only as a people, not only as a community or as a group, you start uh, feeling whether you are belonging to the nation. Right. All these sort of things in stages it comes. Now. <clears throat> People from the Northeast, from, from my own uh, experience in 1976, when I went to uh, Delhi as, a, you know, right after my class 12 exam to take admission at Delhi University, uh, I was asked very often, hey, you don't look like a Northeasterner. So till then I did not know how does, you know, a Northeasterner would look, you know. So what I mean to say is, slowly and gradually i realized that that particular word is creating a sort of a barrier but that is not to be blamed because of the fact that little 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 bit of ignorance now over time when the knowledge when the communication system improve it has gone all you know in a very magnificent way all over right? so my point is when you talk about identities and um ethnic ethnicities belongingness you must remember one thing that all the different writers and authors have been dealing with it in different ways say for example some of the writers some of the fiction writers would like to uh, express in terms of conflict zones in terms of you know other values like displacement and the conflict between different communities and ethnic groups all sorts of things have appeared in writings but the fact remains even though these are the there are certain problems sometime or other, you know other the fact is that you know as a group as a group when they interact with each other the hostility and things are not there in fact because of the fact that a lot of times in history uh, mr singh was uh, uh, talking about shankar dev shankar dev was one person one a saint who really uh, almost mitigated the difference between different community members, you know, through his um, beliefs. So now, such types of situation, when things have improved in technology, in uh, in other other communication systems, and uh, everything, digitization of literatures and things like that, folklore have spread to different. Say, for example, in Assam Saitya Sabha, um, 
No, the president of Assam Saito once one time was Dr. Bhupan Azika, the famous lyricist and you know singer. He in one one um, sent uh, in one song he has written how Brahmaputra is carrying the meaning of solidarity. You know. So what I need to say is that uh, incidentally, in that chair I'm sitting now, I'm very lucky that way. So what I'm saying is this concept of solidarity, this concept of uh, uh, an identity not hostile to others is now uh, 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 is now getting reflected in a lot of literature. That is what uh, So I would uh, ask you just finish in two, three lines because there's not much time left. That uh, what is your mindscape impression of life in Northeast India? Uh, or as a fiction writer? Oh, fiction writer's mindscape is very difficult to be, you know, shown to others because, you know, a lot many times we keep changing, but basically I write, if I talk about my own thing, I write about the inner journey towards my own mind, you know, mindscape. Basically, uh, it's a little different in that way because it's not what I'm seeing, rather what I'm feeling. You know yeah, about a particular incident that is the theme of my writing and the style but in lot many times say you have mamang dai from urnachal you have mitra Bhupan from assam you have other lot of along from nagaland and things like that. a lot of people are writing very uh, important stories particularly the conflict violence and other issues even say mamang dai has written about a community called adi in you know urnachal Pradesh. so they, the different facets of literature is coming up now in fiction is good development. Okay. That's good. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, I will go to Mr. Das Gupta. Actually, sir, I had two questions, but the time is so less. One question is, uh, I wanted to ask you, how do the South Asian diasporic authors define transcultural identity in its narrative discourses? And the second question was, what is new about South Asian literature? I'm sorry. Can you repeat your first question? Yeah, uh, the first question is, how do the South Asian diasporic authors uh, define transcultural identity in its narrative discourses, in their narrative discourses? Okay, so uh, let, me, let, let, let me club both the questions together because of shortage of time and say that... Thank you, hello, hello. Uh, there, there are there are some issues, as uh, uh, Kula pointed out, and uh, Honorable D.P. Singh, uh, in which people may more or less have the same view when they are writing. You know, an issue like poverty, for example, uh, an issue like uh, deprivation, uh, an issue like a conflict. Uh, so there, there are there are many issues in which. Uh, people might find common ground, irrespective of uh, where they are writing from. Uh, you know, uh, a person from Nepal who is suffering from hunger uh, would would uh, feel, I think, the same emotion as a person from Tiruvannapura, uh, and there would be similarity. The second is that I think. Uh, there is a great deal of, of assertion of identity, which unfortunately, within India, for a variety of reasons, has not found space. And that's because uh, certain states, uh, writers from certain states have dominated uh, because of whatever their literary talent or whatever it is, but they have dominated the landscape. And the same as in, in, in South Asia, Indian writers have dominated the landscape and very few of the non-Indian writers within the region are known to us. I mean, if, if you and I were to walk into a bookshop <coughs> and try to look at Indian writers, I dare say it would be very difficult for you to find writers from Bhutan whose books are available or from Bangladesh. Uh, you might also find it very difficult to find uh, books by by writers from, uh, let's say, Manipur, uh, available on the bookshelf uh, in in Indian bookshops. 
so there is a dominance in 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 this, and I think uh, literature uh, and, and and it's a very interesting subject that Kulo has just pointed out, uh, where where when he writes his fiction, he is trying to 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 look at the world not in terms of what he sees, but in terms of what he feels. And uh, that's a fascinating line, actually, when King Lear asked the blind Earl of Gloucester, uh, how do you see? Uh, the blind Earl replied, I see by feeling. And so feeling is a very strong uh, emotion by which uh, people see the world. But feeling uh, is not devoid of seeing. And I do hope and I do pray and hope uh, that efforts can be made by which writing from uh, people in South Asia can be encouraged, uh, that there are platforms available to allow for this to be widely available within the region, which is not the case today. I mean, how many Bhutanese writers, um, uh, you know, when books are you able to get in, let's say, uh, a premier bookshop in Delhi? I would say none. And yet there are writers from Bhutan. Uh, and, and somehow or the other, when people write, naturally they would like to be read. And uh, so if we talk about the South Asian way of thinking, I think collectively we need to encourage everyone uh, to be able to expose this. To do that, you have to recognize you cannot dominate the landscape. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. My last question to Mr. B.P. Singh, sir. Uh, <clears throat> sir, how do South Asian literature accounts the political and the composite culture which helped in attaining the freedom movement of India? I must also tell you a more futuristic thing because freedom movement was greatly influenced by the writers. But today, as I look at it, a great experiment is taking place in South Asia. And that is, of which you said, living the different languages, as has been mentioned, India and Nepal are predominantly Hindu, Pakistan. Bangladesh, Afghanistan, and Maldives are predominantly Islamic. Bhutan, Tibet, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar are predominantly Buddhist. And uh, they have different languages and different modes of expression. But there is a strange logic. If you go to Bangalore, you cannot find literature of Bhutan or literature of Mizoram or Nagal, but you will find boys and girls serving in the shops. Similarly, similar things are happening in Delhi. Their proficiency is right. So our attention has to be on institutions of that we have to set up to see that they get lifted and that then the politics will change. The second thing is that there is various kinds of conflict taking place, violence. Geopolitics is there and geopolitics is not going to have its flow. But yet at the same time, if you look at the world, if our literature expresses the world, man, look at the world. There are genuine problems, mutual relationship between Christianity and Islam, Christianity and uh, 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 tribal societies. And there, maybe, that South Asia experiment. And here the writers of a good role, in my view, can show that affinity is possible. And, and I am a great 
spirit of the North Eastern experiment, that they have shown it, they have absorbed Ramayana Mahabharata, they have absorbed Christianity, they have absorbed a certain variety, but at the same time, they have preserved their language, they have preserved their way of life. And all small tribes, big tribes, of course, process of um, uh, merging will take place. So I am, if it depends upon the authors, the writers, can they project some Asian experiment of better living, a more fulfilling life, which is the goal of literature, a more harmonious to the world. In a state of being inward looking all the time, we can be an example. Because democracy has also come. There are good institutions. Look, the other day they said uh, the institution set up by uh, Jamsayji Tata, the Indian Institute of Science of Bangalore, is the best institution among the scientific institu institutes of the world. I'm saying once we have that kind of institution, sometimes it makes me sad that the year Nalanda was destroyed, but the process of destruction of Nalanda began and completed. That was the year Oxford had started life. If South Asia had that kind of... And the writers can play a role. Politicians, of course, can play a role. But the writers can play a role. But I have yet to see that kind of literature. Of, of course, the quality of literature has improved in various Wonderful, parts. Sir. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, oh. Uh, thank you, uh, Vishakaji, for wonderfully moderating today's session. First of all, I extend uh, deep gratitude to our circuit panelists, Balmiki sir, Kuladhar sir, Amit Gupta sir, and, uh, and again our board director Vishakadas. Thanks for sharing this great information to us on today's theme, Multivalent Societies, Mirror South Asian Literature. I also want to extend special thanks to our audience who have been patiently watching this uh, session for last one hour. I see a lot of comments from them, so I hope uh, Vishaka will be replying them soon. So the recording of this session will be uploaded on our official channel on YouTube soon. So thanks again to all of you for your time, participation and presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I must tell you, Mr. Das Gupta.